The 140 kilometres of coastline between Bermagui and the Victoria and New South Wales border is one of the pe most picturesque and interesting on the New South Wales coast. Now, it's dotted with little fishing villages such as Marimbula, which you see behind me there. The fishing, whether you be an amateur or a professional, whether you like to reef fish or game fish, is absolutely magnificent. In fact, it has yielded, in recent weeks even, a couple of world record marlin. The hinterland is dotted with dairy farms and, and beef and lamb and wool are growing in there, and it is also very rural and interesting and picturesque. And all in all, the Sapphire Coast is truly a magnificent place to visit. Now, it's bypassed by most of the Melbourne to Sydney traffic because, of course, they go up the Hume Highway inland via Albury and Canberra, and the, the Princess Highway runs through the Sapphire Coast. So it's not cluttered with a lot of tourism. There aren't the sort of normal garish tourist traps that you, that you expect to find in areas which are really heavily frequented by tourists. It re retains its picturesque village atmosphere. It really is a place to visit, and that's exactly what we're going to do right now. The northern gateway to the Sapphire Coast is Bermagui, which was put on the world map in the mid-30s by Western author Zane Grey because of his interest in game fishing and effectively was the birthplace of game fishing in Australia. It has an extremely safe harbour with plenty of capacity, a good entrance in all weathers regardless of what the tide or wind may be and is a haven for boats which are plying the coast. Bermagui and indeed the Sapphire Coast is a mecca for thousands of amateur fishermen of all ages who run up and down the coast pulling mega bags of fish out of the water all the time. Now the marlin I mentioned earlier is an Australian record claim caught by Paul Harris on the 28th of January 1985. You know, it's amazing what you find. We just called into Laurie and Nancy Jones's shell shop in a back street in Bermagui and came across this remarkable species of crab. Now it's called Lithotus longispinus. It was dredged up in 380 fathoms of water in April 1984 by a trawler. Now, um, photos of this crab were sent to the university and the university said it's an extremely rare species of long-legged crab, deep sea crab, never before been found in this part of the world. In fact, Two came up, a male and a female, a pair. The Joneses have a remarkable collection of crabs and rare shells, rare uh, species of, uh, of ocean life, particularly spider crabs and octopi and pipefish and all kinds of things there, including this very interesting coconut crab. Now, this, this crab actually climbs trees, snips coconuts off, climbs back down again and opens them and does it all much more quickly than a really practised native can do it. It is a coconut-eating, tree-dwelling, crab, really remarkable and typical of the sort of things that you, that you can find in little backwaters when you're travelling around a place such as Bermagui. Bermagui offers some of the finest mountain, lake and coastal scenery in Australia and dominating the district is Mount Dromedary, named by Captain Cook on his first voyage of discovery in 1770. The Montague Island Light is one of the most famous on the New South Wales coast and it's been there since 1881. The granite which was quarried on the island to build the lighthouse is beautifully sawn. Obviously the stonemasons who did the job here knew their business. The dwellings were actually built before the lighthouse and were used by the builders while the lighthouse was being built. We guess that they've been there since about 1800 and 75. Now the light of course originally was kerosene, it's now electricity. The head of the light with the lens in it, the glass lenses by the way are also completely original, floats in mercury. It weighs about five tonnes and that is the way in which the light is able to be driven by a tiny little electric motor and a gearbox. Now the island has an area of about 12 hectares, the southern end of which is granite and that's where we are now with the lighthouse on top of it and the northern end is basalt. Montague is fairly readily accessible to even small boats in moderately good weather and there are charter boats if you don't have your own with you. The charter and fishing boats have experienced skippers who know where the fish are and who can take you to the island and to the various fishing spots. By the way, there's a fairly large colony of grey seals which live on the northern end of the island and are always ready to hop in the water and clown around when you go by. They really are characters. Camel Rock is a local landmark just north of Bermagui and just inland from Camel Rock is the magnificent Wallaga Lake. 
Now, Wallaga is one of the most beautiful estuarine lakes on the southern New South Wales coast and has about 100 kilometres of foreshore, is extremely popular with the caravanning and camping fraternity. Wallaga Lake is absolutely perfect for water skiing, for fishing, sailing and swimming, and in season the lake is excellent for prawning. The Bermagui Wallaga Lake District offers many fine caravan parks, several good motels, a hotel and first-class self-contained holiday flats. Golfers, tennis players and bowlers are all catered for and you're sure to get a cordial welcome when next you visit Bermagui. About 50 kilometres south of Bermagui and 15 kilometres east of Bega is the delightful relaxed holiday village of Tartra, set amongst forest areas, lakes and national parks. Tartra offers such sporting facilities as golf, tennis and bowls, but its locals boast that Tartra has some of the best beaches and fishing spots on the New South Wales coast. Kyanini Bay is just south of Tartra Township and is quite a remarkable deep water access boat ramp that's deep water all the way through from the open ocean around a couple of bends which effectively shield the ramp from the worst of the weather and it's possible to launch a small of course seaworthy boat at the ramp and have access to open ocean almost immediately. At Tartra you can fish in the surf, off the rocks, in the rivers and lakes or from the historic Tartra Wharf. The Tartra Wharf was first built in 1860 and is one of three buildings in the area classified by the National Trust. Another is Rob Little's pub. The pub, along with the many clubs on the Sapphire Coast, provides a wide variety of entertainment for all age groups, including some of Australia's top bands performing there during our visit, of course, was Mark Hunter and Dragon. And from a dragon of one kind to a dragon of another, this goanna was at the Bournder State Recreation Area, which is about 14 kilometres south of Tartra. The Bournder area offers spectacular scenery, superb beaches, and is a very popular for its natural environment, especially with bushwalking enthusiasts. The diversity of water environments at Bournder, with its salt and freshwater lakes, make the park unique among state recreation areas. The park is well serviced with camping and recreational facilities, yet the natural environment is unspoiled and has a strong sense of primeval wilderness. High Ridge Hut was constructed by the Bega Tartra Conservation Society for use by approved groups as a base for field studies. There's High Ridge Hut there with a group of people uh, entering the hut to have a look at the various aspects of the flora and fauna in the State Recreational Park. By far the biggest lake in the Bournder State Recreation Area is Wallagoot Lake. Wallagoot, as does Mogarika Inlet, which is a beautiful spot at the entrance to the Bega River, offers excellent fishing, sailing, water skiing, windsurfing and canoeing, and at the right time of year the prawns are absolutely magnificent. Inland from Tartra, on the way to Bega, is Mumbler Creek. There are barbecue and picnic facilities there, and the natural rock water slide has been a well-kept secret for years. The little town of Marimbula is one of the most attractive of the towns on the Sapphire Coast and it next in behind this fairly gentle bar entrance. They tell me that it's gentle in most weathers and I tend to believe that because the prevailing weather is from the south and it's protected by a big headland there. The little town of Marimbula is one of the most attractive of the towns on the Sapphire Coast and it nestles in behind this fairly gentle bar entrance. They tell me that it's gentle in most weathers and I tend to believe that because the prevailing weather is from the south and it's protected by a big headland there. And there's a nice deep lagoon there for even the largest of boats. Behind it, 
Over behind me there is the town with all of the facilities that you could possibly require and of course access to the hinterland and the hinterland contains some of the most interesting of all the attractions up and down the coast. Let's visit Marimbula and some of her attractions. Marimbula is the hub of the Sapphire Coast and is in fact less than a day's easy drive from almost two thirds of Australia's population. And that's important particularly with today's high petrol prices. Now it's 596 kilometres from Melbourne and 467 kilometres from Sydney and it's very close to Canberra and most of the major population centres of New South Wales and Victoria can access it within a day's easy drive. If you prefer to fly, Marimbula is serviced with daily flights from Melbourne by Kendall Airlines and Sydney by Air New South Wales. Accommodation is of a high standard and there are motels, self-contained holiday flats and five caravan parks in the area. The many restaurants and club bistros are well respected for their excellent cuisine, especially the seafood. Pambula Marimbula is one of the two superb golf courses in the area and is well known for its hospitality and the 80 or so kangaroos that are very friendly and resident on the course. If you're into the pokies, there are five licensed clubs in the area where you can have a fling and you never know, you may be lucky enough to win a jackpot. But Marimbula is best known for its water activities with some excellent surfing along the beaches. In fact, there's a left-hand break off the bar at Marimbula which is renowned as being one of the best on the New South Wales coast. In the lake, you can go sailboarding and there are safe beaches for swimming and sunbaking and you can really enjoy yourself there. Now the Sapphire Coast is called that because of the colour of the water. It's a magnificent colour, extremely clean and free of industrial pollution. It's a magnificent place for the children and there are no nasties as far as water creatures are concerned. The Marimbula Princess is one of the more interesting attractions at Marimbula. She's a jet powered ferry which will seat about 50 people and Alan Shand is the skipper. Now he comes up with some very interesting tricks, Alan. Halfway around the trip, he'll anchor, go over the side, and you can see exactly what he does. Alan's trip is really interesting. He dives over the side and catches all these unique little sea creatures. Now there's a really good example of a live seahorse. You don't really often see live seahorses, but have a look at it. It's a really lively little fellow there. A beautiful example of a seahorse showing, by the way, a bit of distress at being out of the water. So I'll put him back in the water now so he can survive to be caught another day. Here's a toadfish, common up and down the coast. See them absolutely everywhere. They they are mollusk eaters, they have grinders instead of teeth in those jaws there and fairly sharp spines on the top. This one's not going to cooperate. Normally what they do is blow themselves up about five or six times their normal size when you pull them out of the water. By the way, they're easy to catch, they're everywhere. Whatever you do, don't eat them. The, the meat is poisonous, so I'll put him back in. A sea urchin, again with spines all over it. This one's been rolled around on the sand and the rocks are bit by the, by the look of it. A lot of those spines have been blunted off but they're very interesting as well. By the way, they eat from the bottom through that, that aperture in the bottom there, and a really spiny starfish. Now, it's not a crown of thorns, although it does look very much like a crown of thorns, typical of the sort of sea creatures that you can actually see and handle during your trip on the Marimbula Princess. The steamer wharf at uh, Marimbula was built in 1901 and really it was the only link with either Sydney in the north or Melbourne in the south by steamers. Now the wharf deteriorated over the ensuing 50 years and in about 1979 it was deliberately burnt to the waterline for safety reasons. It was an excellent fishing wharf and it enabled people to actually deep sea fish without the use of a boat so a committee was formed with the daunting task of raising $200,000 to replace the Marimbula Wharf. Now they were successful, the wharf was rebuilt purely as a fishing wharf. 
Magic Mountain is a recent development at Marimbula. It's only two years old and it's truly a family recreational park. There are two giant in-ground water slides, the most notorious being the Black Hole, which does a complete 360 degree turn underground before it spits you out into the sunlight again. It really is quite an experience. Magic Mountain has barbecue facilities and there's actually a restored Melbourne tram that has been converted to a takeaway food store. Without a doubt, the highlight of Magic Mountain is the giant mountain slide. There are 600 metres of stainless steel track and you ride on those little sleds which have a speed control in the form of a brake lever in the centre. You can obtain speeds of up to 65 or 70 kilometres an hour. All the turns are banked and it really is a ride to remember. It's as close to bobsledding as you'll ever get and it really is exciting. I must admit, I rode down five or six times and got faster each time. I don't know how you feel about it, you either love them or you don't, but I absolutely love oysters. I think they're absolutely delicious. And of course New South Wales is famous for oyster leases all up and down the coast and almost every area that grows oysters claims to have the best oysters in New South Wales. Now Shelley and Chris Boyton here on Marimbula Lake have a couple of leases and they grow oysters which every year win awards at the annual Oyster Growers Convention. Now there's no better authority than that to win an award at the Oyster Growers Convention. They're magnificent oysters, they're Sydney rocks. They grow up and down the whole Sapphire Coast. You'll find leases everywhere. In fact, there are even some public leases where you can actually go and pick the oysters yourself and eat them. And I promise you, this is about the third I've had out of the tray, and they're absolutely delicious. Just another reason to visit the coast, the magnificent oysters. The most interesting way to see the Pambula River just south of Marimbula is aboard Sinbad with skipper Ray Bourne. Well, good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you on board Sinbad. The Pambula River was the wintering place for the Jaguma Aboriginal tribe about two and a half to three thousand years ago. The Aboriginals ate mud oysters, which are considerably larger than rock oysters, and they'd pick these oysters up with their toes from the riverbed at low tide, drop them into a fire until they opened, and eat them, then throw the shells into the bush. Now the middens that result are about 10 to 12 feet deep in some places, the largest to be seen anywhere in New South Wales. The Sinbad is a specially designed punch. He carries up to 24 people on this fascinating trip on the Pambula River. You could really call it a voyage of discovery. Candelo is a little tiny traditional town settled in the hills behind Marimbula. It's about a 20 minute drive from Marimbula. And if you look down there, it looks almost like an elaborate diorama or a beautifully done model railway layout. layout. It's really typical of the way a little town was many years ago. In fact, there's very little to sort of take away from its sort of ancient, old, small, sleepy country town atmosphere. A couple of sort of more modern houses up on the hill there, but generally visiting Candelo, you're really stepping uh, you really are stepping back 70 or 80 years into the past. Now on the top of this rise behind Candelo is the convent. Let's have a look at that. Hello Jean, how are you? Hello Chris, how are you? Fine, thanks. I thought I might come back and have another look at the house. Lovely, do come okay, in. Okay, thank you, good. The house was built in 1898 as a convent for the Sisters of St Joseph, which was a teaching order. Now in 1904, because of the dairying and, and uh, butter produce, etc. from the area, there were 67 pupils in the school, which was just out behind the house. By the way, this is Swami, she's the cat of the house. Because of the uh, decline in the dairy industry in the area over the ensuing years, in 1976 the sisters found that it was no longer viable to live here and the Montgomerys were able to buy the house in 1976. Now it's become the family home. It's cluttered beautifully with the most magnificent array of antiques and bric-a-brac and June has worked on most of them and restored them. There's a good example up there in this, that hutch in the kitchen here. And June even goes to the trouble of actually duplicating antiques using not necessarily modern materials but present day materials. In fact she built this magnificent four poster bed herself using red cedar 
draws out of a Singer sewing machines. She set it up so that it really does duplicate an antique of 100 or 150 years ago and does so magnificently. In fact, it's impossible to tell the difference. She even built this cradle for her children. One of the delightful aspects of the Sapphire Coast is its hinterland. Bega is the dairying centre of southern New South Wales and the commercial centre of the Sapphire Coast with a population of 5,000. It was settled in 1831 and its visit to the historical museum dating back to the 1860s gives an amazing insight into the pioneering days of the Bega Valley. Bega abounds with places of interest and with Bega as your base you can visit the Bega Cheese Factory, the Rotolacta, the Civic Centre, Brogo Dam or any of the many clubs in the area. Around 10 kilometres south of Bega is the Kamaruka Estate, the largest and most comprehensive rural enterprise in the Bega Valley. There are around about a thousand head of these prime plump Jersey cows at Kamaruka Estate and they're milked twice a day, which of course by simple arithmetic is 2,000 milkings a day. Now the estate is set up to do that efficiently. Most of the milk goes to the, the Bega, to the Sapphire Coast area, but some of it of course is used to make the famous Kamaruka cheese. Let's have a look a little further down the estate. The clock tower in the background there is the only completed section of a proposed stable complex which was not completed due to the start of the First World War. Kamaruka has some magnificent old buildings on the property and one of the most prominent is the Holy Trinity Church which was built by voluntary labour in 1869. The homestead is now a restaurant, it was built in 1845. English and European trees were planted and an ornamental lake created to transform Kamaruga into an English gentleman's residence and one of the finest properties in the country. In fact, Kamaruga is one of the few early established properties in Australia which is still owned and worked by descendants of one of the original owners. So there it is, a little bit of history, 150 years old, absolutely fascinating and the nice thing about it is that it's within about a 20 minute drive of almost anywhere on the Sapphire Coast. So if you're visiting in your boat and you're staying at a caravan park and you either hire or borrow a car or whatever you do, it's very easy to visit this truly magnificent place. Eden is one of the major ports on the Sapphire Coast. In fact, it's the last port you jump off from when you're heading south across Bass Strait and, of course, the first one on the mainland that you reach when you're heading north. It has a deep harbour, in fact, the sixth deepest harbour in the world and at one stage during the Second World War, the Queen Mary anchored there. This is Ben Boyd's Tower. The town was settled in the early 1800s by Ben Boyd, who was a whaling captain. He built this stone tower on the southern headland for spotting whales and he built Boyd Town as the nucleus for a very large settlement which really never came to pass and Boyd Town, which was the main home in, of the settlement, has remained and is now a resort and a very interesting one, I might add, full of antiques, very, very old, but beautifully preserved and maintained. Twofold Bay is a large anchorage, as I said, capable of, of taking very large ships and it abounds with boating facilities such as this very large launching ramp. Now, if you want to fish, Twofold Bay will yield deep sea fish virtually all over. There is quite a lot of shoreline to explore, sandy beaches, rocky headlands, all of the scenery that you could hope to find in this truly beautiful anchorage. The little town of Eden is fairly sleepy. It's now a fishing village since whaling stopped quite a few years ago. And the accommodation is exemplified by the Blue Marlin Motel, which offers excellent cuisine and, most interestingly, a heated indoor swimming pool so that you can actually swim there all year round. Now, if you'd like to explore Twofold Bay, Cat Baloo Cruises offers an excellent service. She's a steel catamaran-type cruiser capable of carrying 60 or 70 people and she carries out quite an extensive cruise right around the shores of Twofold Bay on a daily basis. She visits the wood chip mill which is on the southern shore, Boyd Town, all of the little inlets and the beautiful scenery that abound in the area. Actually she does it quite quickly too and she's capable of handling 
quite rough weather and still rem remaining sufficiently stable for the people on board to be comfortable. She forges along there quite happily and because of the fact that she's actually a cat or a tunnel hull boat, she has excellent lateral stability. In fact, it's even possible to sit upstairs on Cat Baloo during a cruise and still be perfectly comfortable. Now, Eden is steeped in whaling history. By the way, it also carries storage tanks for fuel for the entire southeast New South Wales area. You can see, you just saw them in the background there. Um, whaling was the, the reason that Eden was established and the Whaling Museum is one of the most fascinating visits on the Sapphire Coast. Whaling commenced in the Twofold Bay Eden area around about the early 1830s, but from about 1850 on, or the early 1850s on, a most amazing occurrence took place. There was a team of, or a herd of killer whales, in fact they are a team as you'll see in just a moment, just like this fella here, who had lived in the area for quite a long time and had been coming in and out of the bay. They established a very close relationship with the Davidson family who were whalers in the area at that time. And this relationship is unique, is historically unique in the world as far as a symbiotic relationship between man and beast is concerned. These whales used to arrive in Twofold Bay about a month or so before the whales were due to migrate north, the killer whales, and they would go out and herd the whales into Twofold Bay to be slaughtered by the whaling men. Now, not only did, was that done deliberately by these killer whales and intelligently, but also they did things like pulling whaling boats along with their teeth. Now, I'll tell you about old Tom in a minute, but if you just have a look here, there are teeth missing. On this side of his jaw, there's a notch out of that teeth where, over a period of over 80 years, this whale and 15 or 16 others in the team assisted the whalers in killing, of course, the, the normal whales, the humpback and the, the baleen and the sperm whales that were coming through the area all the time and kept the industry going. In fact, Tom died, old Tom died, on the 17th of September 1930. At that stage, his age is variously estimated between 80 and 150 years old. And his compatriots, the other whales in the team, were around about the same age, of course, varying ages. Now, they went a little further than that. As I said, they towed boats, they towed whales which had been harpooned and which had gotten away. They even went to the extent of protecting whalers who'd either fallen or jumped overboard during the chase in order to secure the whale from the sharks which were attracted to the area by the blood spilled by the whalers. Now, I don't agree with whaling and I'm very happy that it's banned and that whales are now a protected species, but when you consider the history that this area offers as far as whaling is concerned, when you consider that it's totally unique in the world, it really is fascinating. You know, it's a sad thing that the people who make the history or are almost never sufficiently conscious of making history to preserve their artefacts. And Beryl here is an excellent case in point. No matter how hard people searched around the Eden Twofold Bay area, it was impossible to find a reasonable example of one of the old whaling boats. So plans were sought from the USA, and of course our boats were patterned along USA lines. And Beryl was built in Eden in 1983. Now she is a perfect replica of the boats that were used by the whaling men. And imagine having 90 feet of whale, very angry and very anxious to be a long way away in as short a time as possible, hanging on to the end of this boat and towing her along at anything up to 25 or 30 knots with all the, the guys aboard. Now you really had to be a man in order to sink that harpoon into the whale knowing full well that it could very well be the end of you and your boat. One tiny brush with the flukes of a giant tail could turn this into matchwood and you were out in a very hostile ocean with predatory sharks around attracted by the fight and by the blood of the whale. So these really were men and they worked hard for what they, for what they eventually achieved. A beautiful example of the boat builder's art. She really is built in, on traditional lines and she's worth a visit just to see. That's a harpoon head. Uh, typical of the hand-launched harpoons. That had around about 14 or 15 feet of timber shaft fixed behind it there, and it was launched into the whale from very, very close quarters by the harpoon the harpoonist who was mounted up in the bow.
So there it is from the gateway to the Sapphire Coast, Bermagui in the north, right down through Tarthra, Marimbula, Pambula, right down to Eden. We've covered a lot of the aspects of this coast which really make it an appealing place to visit. But I promise you we've, we've had to miss a lot more than we've shown you. It's an interesting place. It's unspoilt by irresponsible development. There's a, a covenant against high-rise. You won't see irresponsible high-rise type uh, building development happen in this area in the foreseeable future. And because of the fact that it's bypassed by the major Sydney Melbourne highway, you also won't see it cluttered up with a whole lot of tourists and other people. So it's a magnificent place to visit. A quiet fishing village atmosphere prevails all the time. There's a lot of history here, particularly in the Twofold Bay area that you see behind me. And it really is a magnificent place. We've enjoyed our stay. We've enjoyed the hospitality of a lot of really friendly people that have made it even more interesting and more enjoyable to stay here. And we'll see you next week with another World of Boats. In the meantime, take care and safe boating.